Hello everyone, good afternoon from Caracas. For Telesera, I'm Cody Weddle in Caracas. To begin, the newly elected Argentinian president, Mauricio Macri, he has sworn, he was sworn in some hours ago, and he's now the new head of state of that nation. Macri addressed Congress during the ceremony, and he spoke about several issues, such as corruption and drug trafficking. Now, the speech of the newly sworn in president, it was very brief. It only lasted about 27 minutes. Meanwhile, on Wednesday evening, thousands gathered at the symbolic Plaza de Mayo outside the Casa Rosada Presidential Palace in Buenos Aires to say goodbye to uh, exiting President Cristina Fernandez. Sympathizers and activists showed their support for Fernandez, who was not able to attend uh, Mauricio Macri's swear-in ceremony after a judge ruled her term would end on Wednesday night. President Fernandez highlighted the changes for Argentina that she will leave behind her as her main achievements. This Argentina that we will leave without debt, as it had never been before. This Argentina that we will leave with 119 disappeared grandsons found and reunited. This Argentina that we will leave as an example to the world that there is no impunity and that we do not need a foreign tribunals to take care of our history and our tragedy, a unique case in the world. And our correspondent in Buenos Aires, Laureano Ponce, he went to what was a massive demonstration, as we just saw there, for President Fernandez, and he reports on, he reports now on how uh, support for the Kirchners remains very high in certain sectors of Argentina. Thousands of Argentinians marched into the Plaza de Mayo Square in Buenos Aires to say farewell to President Cristina Fernandez. Despite having met the end of her term, Fernandez still finds strong popular support. Oh, Today we begin a new period. It is the end of 12 years in which we have achieved many things, where the people came first. And today is the beginning of a new period for those of us who have stood up for this process. Now we will be in the opposition to a conservative government, but we will always stand with the people. Besides social movements, thousands of individuals who do not belong to any political organization also march into the square and praise the achievements made during the last decade. Besides having become a political activist, I saw my country develop, so I came here basically out of love. I believe everything we have achieved these years is important, everything that we have got back, like the feeling that the people has the power. Those who filled the Plaza de Mayo this Wednesday evening to see out President Cristina did so in an atmosphere of celebration and of resistance in clear relation to the right-wing government that will lead Argentina for the next four years. The whole Peronista movement, the whole Front for Victory, is here to say we have achieved many things. We lost the elections, but we are willing to defend what we have achieved through these years and to keep up and gain strength to recover the path of sustainable development, regional integration, and the quality jobs for all Argentinians. This massive rally seems to prove that Cristina Fernandez will remain a main political figure in the opposition to Mauricio Macri's presidential term. Laureano Ponce, Telesur, Buenos Aires. Moving on, hundreds gathered outside of the Miraflores Presidential Palace here in Caracas, Venezuela, in support of the ruling United, United Socialist Party. Now, the so-called Assembly in the Streets, as it was called, it aimed to bring the government closer to the people. After Sunday's parliamentary defeat against the governing party, activists and sympathizers waited until late into the evening to greet President Nicolás Maduro, who addressed the crowds, reassuring that his revolutionary government is fully committed with the people. Either there is people building this revolution, or there will be no revolution ever. Or the revolution stands for the people, or the revolution will be over. Now in these three years, we have been under siege through a brutal war which we had never witnessed before, and other acts of aggression that we have seen in the past. And our correspondent in Caracas now, Isabel Finbo, explains more uh, from outside there uh, in the street assembly uh, outside of the Miraflores Presidential Palace. The new National Assembly might not meet until January, but this is the first street assembly. Grassroots supporters of the revolution have come to debate, exchange ideas and strengthen the revolution.
It is, the, it is the assembly of the people's movement, where it's us who guide where the ship goes, together with our president. It's not three days since the Venezuelan Socialist Party lost parliamentary elections, but activists are back out on the street. The mood here, just down the road from the presidential palace in Caracas, is anything but sober. We have 17 years of revolution in the streets. The streets belong to the people, and we're not going to leave them. Meetings like this are happening around the country, as President Nicolás Maduro called on Chavistas to reflect on the electoral defeat that saw the opposition gain a supermajority. In defense of our beautiful revolution, Chavez's people are in the streets because they can win the assembly. But they do not win the Chavista people. The Chavista people are going to be in the streets defending their revolution, as always. The government hopes that meetings like this will help them reconnect with everyday Venezuelans. They have been criticized for being overconfident and complacent in the support of the people. The people today have more strength than before because we are not going to lose heart, we are not going to be scared of, no. We are going to have more strength to continue fighting. The optimism of the crowd belies the fear that when the opposition takes over the assembly, it will make sweeping changes to the social gains. But for now, they are defiant, optimistic and not going to take defeat quietly. Isabel Fimbo Telesur in Caracas. And we turn our attention to Mexico now, where worker unions have united against a controversial pensions reform. The workers are protesting a proposed pension system that the government wants to approve, which will allow pension funds to be used in the financial market. Workers believe this is the first step towards privatizing the pension system. And over 4,000 migrants are still stranded in Costa Rica as they try to make their way to the United States. The Costa Rican government faced a new setback on Wednesday when the authorities of Belize blocked the Cuban migrants' possibility of entry. Costa Rican authorities plan to send the migrants on an airplane to Belize where they would continue their journey through land. However, Belize joined Guatemala in closing that possibility, further narrowing Costa Rica's options to solve this crisis. The FARC guerrillas freed one soldier it had captured two weeks ago. Now, the soldier was reportedly abducted while he was on his way home. The FARC leadership said the action carried out by uh, one of FARC's many brigades attempted against the unilateral ceasefire and demanded the soldier to be set free. Members of the International Red Cross monitored the liberation of the soldier. Puerto Rico. The Congressional Ethics Committee in Brazil was set to evaluate the possibility of launching an investigation for corruption on the Speaker of the Lower House, Eduardo Cunha. However, after a heated verbal fight broke out between several lawmakers, the committee suspended the session. According to Brazil's Attorney General, Cunha is involved in the Petrobras corruption scandal. The new session will take place on Tuesday of next week. The ruling Unity Labor Party, or ULP, led by Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonsalves, has retained power after the country's general elections in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Now, the ULP's victory was a slim one as it won eight seats, while the opposition New Democratic Party gained seven seats. However, the ULP has called for a recount in two constituencies, which were won by the NDP. And we turn back to Argentina now because we have our correspondent on the line, Leo Poletti Caduti, as uh, Argentina prepares for uh, the term of Mauricio Macri, the new president there in Argentina. Uh, Leonel, I'm wondering if you, should just, if you can just tell us about the atmosphere in there in Argentina. Um, they have a new president there. What are people saying in the streets? Very good afternoon to you, Cody, and all of our viewers of Venezuela. I can tell you I'm located right in the middle of the historical Plata de Mayo, just opposite from the Argentine government house, where Mauricio Macri uh, has just been transferred power just less than an hour ago. Uh, I can tell you the atmosphere here was uh, one of absolute celebration, lots of... Uh, lo uh, a big party atmosphere, I would sum it up here in the Plaza uh, de Major, in the uh, main square of the city of Buenos Aires. At the moment, though, uh, people uh, have quickly started to exit 
the square uh, from the appointment of Coronax, which was obviously when ceremony was taken in place. Uh, I can to now. I can tell you that uh, the, the square is uh, at less than 50% capacity. It was quite full about a half hour ago, uh, but uh, to illustrate how full this square was today, uh, I'll have to compare it with the squares, um, how it was yesterday afternoon when uh, the uh, uh, first and I tried to come to the uh, plaza with my family uh, late yesterday afternoon and it was absolutely full. We couldn't uh, we couldn't really make it to the square. The uh, the president uh, box around the square, which was completely cut off. Whereas today, during Mauricio Macri's uh, swearing in and the uh, and the formalities of transferring power to him, uh, I was able to walk here with uh, with uh, my workmate, a uh, cameraman here for the We were able to walk deep into the plaza without any problems whatsoever. That just basically illustrates uh, how the public responded to Mauricio Macri's uh, swearing in today here in Buenos Aires. Poletti there um, after a historic swearing in ceremony of uh, the new president there in Argentina, Mauricio Macri. Leonel, we're having some problems with your audio, but we heard most of your uh, report there. Leonel, thanks. Thanks, Cody. La sociedad privilegiaba liderazgos individuales en todos los ámbitos. The cop. We continue now. The COP21 president uh, and French foreign minister, Laurent Fabius, says that the nations battling to forge a climate deal are making good progress. Now, the deadline for a deal is meant to be Friday. However, a senior Chinese negotiator says it is very likely that the summit will continue into Saturday. The French presidency was due to present a second draft of the final agreement in the coming hours. Now, the first draft released on Wednesday still had large areas where no consensus had been reached, and many climate campaigners said it was too it was uh, too weak. And while uh, leaders work on a deal to save mankind from global warming, the aid organization Oxfam dressed up protesters with giant heads in the image of world leaders. Now they say they want world leaders to wake up and recognize the climate chaos that will take place if they fail to secure a strong international agreement during those talks. And one, area is, uh, one of the areas of the world that uh, will likely be most affected by climate change, rising sea levels, is the Caribbean. And so now we turn to our Caribbean correspondent, uh, Allison Kentish, who, who is covering uh, the climate talks. Uh, Allison, how have Caribbean countries, they uh, expect to be very affected by climate change, rising sea levels, many of them, uh, because they're simply small island nations. Uh, so how are they reacting now uh, to this first draft that we now know we have uh, of an agreement uh, that was released yesterday? Yes, uh, good evening. And you are correct. The latest draft of the from the Paris Climate Talks was issued about 3 p.m. yesterday. And I can tell you that Caribbean countries were happy to see the level of protest that followed the issuing of that draft. Immediately after the draft was issued, hundreds of protesters held a sit-in demonstration, and they called for a better deal from the talks. They're saying that that deal should be based on climate justice. So they're calling for stronger action to protect the most vulnerable communities and countries in the world, and that, of course, includes the small island states of the Caribbean. Now, a plenary session on the draft ran into the early hours of this morning, at 3 a.m., Caribbean countries were still in session, still uh, clamoring for that 1.5% cap on greenhouse gas emissions. They got some support from India and Malaysia. These two countries called for solid commitment from wealthy nations to provide financial support for the poorer countries to cope with the impacts of climate change. Now, all this happened within the last 
12 hours, and a new report was issued by the United Nations a few hours ago. And that report stated that recognizing the link between climate change and human rights is an important step towards protecting the fundamental rights of communities across the planet. Now, in terms of the Caribbean, the islands are still holding out some hope. And St. Lucia is leading the 15-member Caribbean community known as CARICOM. St. Lucia is leading those delegation negotiations on behalf of CARICOM. And the country's sustainable development minister, Dr. James Fletcher, has been articulating the CARICOM position that global warming needs to be kept below 1.5 degrees Celsius. He's saying that it is a perspective shared by the Association of Small Island States known as EOSIS and is now being championed by a growing number of developing countries. So the Caribbean maintains hope. They are holding on to that hope until this agreement, the final agreement, is released. And I should clarify here, Allison is in Paris. Is that right? You're in Paris covering the summit. Is that right, Allison? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm based at the Caribbean Pavilion. Okay, so tell us uh, exactly where we are in, in the process now. Do we have that second draft yet, and, and are there signs of progress uh, between the two texts? Can they complete a deal uh, by tomorrow? They are hoping that they can. Uh, Dr. Fletcher, who leads CARICOM's negotiations, is saying that it's not a terrible deal what is being proposed now, but there are some areas where, you know, especially finance, where... There are some sticking points, and uh, he's hoping that those can be clarified. But it will be a really taxing next day and a half because they are saying that they will work all night tonight. They will, it's, um, it's just about after six here in Paris, and they intend to pull another all-nighter if necessary to ensure that they get what they want. But let me make it clear that Caribbean countries have said that they will not accept a bad deal. They came to Paris determined that no deal is better than a bad deal. So they are willing to walk out if they don't get what they want, which is that 1.5 degrees cap. All right, Alison Kent just there uh, covering the COP21 summit from Paris, uh, especially from a Caribbean point of view, a part of the world that uh, will be dramatically affected by climate change. Alison, thanks so much. Thank you. In the latest stage of his diplomatic drive to win agreement over his uh, reform demands, UK, UK Prime Minister David Cameron said during a visit to, in Poland that EU reforms are more important now due to increasing security concerns in Europe. Now I believe if we can secure these reforms, we'll be better off inside. But if you like, this renegotiation, this question, has become bigger and more important with the security crisis that we face in Europe. So it becomes all the more important that uh, we work round the clock to deliver this successful renegotiation. On Wednesday, Turkey's Prime Minister Ahmet Davutoglu accused Russia of attempting uh, ethnic cleansing with its airstrikes in northern Syria that he says have targeted Turkmen and Sunni communities. Now, Russia has fired back at those accusations, saying via its foreign ministry spokeswoman that those accusations are just groundless. The spokeswoman called Ankara's recent statements on Russia a demonstration of, quote, impotent rage. Relations between Ankara and Moscow, you will remember, have plummeted since Turkey shot down a Russian warplane on the Syrian border on November 24th. Gulf monarchs, Gulf monarchs have uh, met in Saudi Arabia for a two-day annual summit called uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council. At the end of the summit, the rulers have endorsed a political solution for Syria. Their announcement came as Syrian opposition and armed groups met also in Riyadh in an attempt to form a unified front ahead of possible talks with the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. And speaking of Syria now, two German Air Force tornado reconnaissance jets have departed for Turkey as part of a joint military campaign against the Islamic State in Syria. Germany's lower house of parliament approved plans to join the military campaign last week. However, it will not be conducting airstrikes there. Instead, the mission is intended to help protect a French aircraft carrier stationed there.
In Yemen, Saudi-led forces battling Houthi fighters there have uh, taken control of the Hainish Islands in the Red Sea. According to the alliance and local fishermen, the islands were used by the group to store and smuggle weapons into Yemen. Now, the coalition has been trying to uh, dislodge the Houthis from areas they had captured since September of last year. The Saudi-led coalition seeks to restore Saudi-backed President Abrabu Mansour Hadi into power. Iraqi Kurdistan's regional president, Masoud Barsani, arrived in Turkey for an official visit. Barsani stated earlier this Thursday that he was satisfied with the outcome of his visit because officials positively discussed a range, range of issues, including the fight against the Islamic State and economic ties. However, there have been uh, growing strains between Ankara and the central Baghdad government over Turkey's deployment of up to 300 soldiers in an area close to northern Iraq that is held by the Islamic State group. Over two months after a U.S. bombing of a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Afghanistan, uh, that organization continues to call for an independent investigation into the incident. Now, the members, they demand justice, so the murders do not go unpunished. Bianca Perez now reports on uh, more on that issue uh, from Washington. They could not have imagined. The organization Doctors Without Borders delivered Wednesday a petition to the White House demanding once again an independent investigation of the U.S. bombing of a hospital in Kunduz, Afghanistan, which left 30 dead and 37 injured. 545,000 people have signed a petition saying that even war has rules. They've, they've called for a reaffirmation of the Geneva Conventions, the laws of war, and the respect for medical facilities by uh, armies around the world, and specifically asking that the U.S. government uh, would consent to an independent investigation to the bombing of our hospital in Afghanistan. Though the organization has asked continuously for an independent investigation, they have not heard back from the U.S. government about complying with this request. Shortly after the bombing, President Obama called our, in our international president, Joanne Liu, to apologize. And General Campbell, in his words, uh, his public words took responsibility for the bombing, but we've had no official response from the White House. The, court has correlated to an open field over 300 the United States Army General has stated that this attack was a human error and that they in fact had the hospital in a no-strike list as they were fully aware of its location. For members of the organization, this statement only enhances the need for an investigation from an impartial source. I came today because I think that the call for an independent investigation is, uh, is valid and important. It just is not possible for uh, an organization that's involved in an event like the U.S. Army to investigate itself. The hospital, which was bombed for over an hour on October 3rd, was the only trauma hospital in that area and had been seeing patients in the northeast part of Afghanistan since 2011. At the time of the attack, there were 105 patients and caretakers in the hospital, along with more than 80 doctors without border staff. Well, it was the largest loss of life for us in, in one single uh, attack on one of our medical facilities. Uh, we've lost uh, at least uh, 14 of our staff uh, in the bombing. Um, we have now cannot provide uh, emergency surgical care to the hundreds of thousands of people who live in Kunduz, and they've lost access to medical care at a very important time. The staff hopes that with their petition, the U.S. government will allow for an investigation that can bring some sort of justice to what they consider a grave violation of humanitarian law. Bianca Perez, Telesur, Washington, D.C. On Wednesday, U.S. President Barack Obama joined Republican lawmakers on Capitol Hill to mark the 150th anniversary of the 13th Amendment, which uh, ended slavery. Now, during his speech, Obama appeared to uh, reference modern-day racial disparities. His speech comes just days after presidential candidate, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump said he would bar all Muslims from entering the country if he was elected. Betray the efforts of the past if we fail to push back against bigotry in all its forms. But we betray our most noble past as well 
if we were to deny the possibility of movement, the possibility of progress, if we were to let cynicism consume us. Late on Wednesday, thousands of people marched through downtown Chicago, demanding the city's mayor, Rahm Emanuel, resign. Now, the rally came after Emanuel addressed the city council, council earlier that day, and he apologized for the 2014 death of 17-year-old Laquan McDonald, who was killed by a police officer. They also called for police officials to step down in light of a whirlwind of controversy over police abuses caught on tape. More protests are scheduled to take place this Thursday. Around 2,000 people made up of Cambodian monks and NGO activists marched on the streets of the capital to mark the 67th anniversary of International Human Rights Day. While making their way in a march towards the Ministry of Justice, calls for the release of imprisoned activists were made to the relevant authorities. The athletics governing body, the International Association of Athletics Federations, is being investigated for its decision to award the 2021 Athletics World Championships to the U.S. city of Eugene. As part of an ongoing probe into the IAAF, French prosecutors are investigating the decision, which was made without a bidding process in April of this year. Now, eyebrows were also raised as Eugene is closely linked to U.S. sportswear firm Nike who paid IAAF's vice president at the time of the vote as an ambassador for the country. Company, I should say. On Wednesday, ahead of her uh, last concert in Cuba, Puerto Rican singer Olga Tañon has urged international artists to carry out cultural exchanges with the island. Now, she added that she felt it is also urgent that many Cuban groups become known globally because of the high quality of artists there. The Grammy Award-winning singer will be performing her last concert on December 12th in Havana, where she will be joined by Cuban artists. That's recovering uh, this afternoon from Caracas. Plenty more on all the stories and others at our website, telesertv.net slash English. Join us as well on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. For Telesur English, I'm Cody Weddle. Have a great day.